So what's the future look like on looking at photographic plates from the past versus looking at new data, you know, new data sets from telescopes like the LSST Vera Ribbon Observatory that's going to come online? Can you use computers and things like that to automatically look for these kinds of transients and see if they're still occurring? Actually, that's exactly what we want to do, but we want to build our own system to look for these kind of transients because we think that these, they are quite short from what we've seen with this place that you can only see them in one place. So what we want to do is to create a system where you have multiple telescopes, where you search for short flashes and you only retain the flashes that are seen in at least two telescopes to make sure that they are authentic. And when you have multiple telescopes, you can also, let's say you have two telescopes, you can measure the parallax to an object uh, inside the solar system. Let's say that this flash comes from something that is blinking or bl blinking or having some laser. By, having, by, by seeing the flash in two telescopes, you will, once you have the parallax, you can get the distance. And now let's say you have 10 of these telescopes and you see the same flash in all 10 of them, then you're going to have a very good accuracy on the distance to that object. At the same time, as you are like validating the flash and you know that it's real, at the same time as you get the 3D location, you can actually also use a so-called wedge prism in order to measure, like get a spectrum in low resolution of all the objects in that field. That is what we are going to do, try to get the real-time spectrum. When you get a spectra on a transient like this, say you catch one and you catch it in multiple telescopes, so you know it's really there. It's not a plate flaw or anything like that. It's really there. And you get a spectra on it. What happens if that spectra is not that of a star? Well, it depends on what we actually see. Because maybe what we are seeing is some kind of uh, communication laser that looks the same as what humans use in their communication satellites. Maybe also the object that we are seeing is uh, in, let's say, in geosynchronous orbit and moves just like a human satellite and shoots a laser just like a human satellite, and there is nothing that indicates any kind of anomaly. Then it's maybe it's not super exciting. But what if that spectrum? What, what if you know that that object is something that is very close to the Earth? It, it moves, let's say, again at the geosynchronous orbit. But what you see is not any laser, and it's some very peculiar type of emission that you've never seen. That would be super cool. Now, well, how would you go about the process of elimination to begin to ask? In other words, if it's a techno signature, then it could have a signature that is, there's no way that can be natural, right? Yeah. And so you say, like with a star, when you see a star spectrum, you see all the absorption lines and all this stuff. And if you don't see that, I mean, it, it would seem to me to be a very fruitful method of SETI to start looking at these transients and try to catch spectra. Well, uh, we have our methods uh, that I cannot reveal yet in the Exopro program, where we will be removing all the human objects like space debris and satellites. And we also have are, are working on establishing a protocol where we remove uh, the remaining unknown objects. So, of course, there's always a chance that you find some very anomalous thing that is some secret, some very secret... Um, uh, experiment that some country on Earth has sent there. But I think we know the boundaries of what humans can cre create and produce, and we will have to check whether the anomalies are within them or outside them. Yeah, that's going to be a problem because that, that's a that's a thing in satellite technology is blinding other satellites, meaning you're emitting some kind of light <laughs> to throw off the, the rival satellites and things like that. Now, what about, will this research result in other discoveries? In other words, might you find, when you're looking for your transients and taking plates with as many telescopes, might you find something like, uh, I don't know, Kuiper Belt objects or uh, Planet Nine, <laughs> something like that? Could you catch that with this survey? I think it's, there's a very good possibility that you can find some very unusual astronomical phenomena that are just happening on these short timescales, because in the timescales we are focusing on, very few astronomers have examined it and that's what what makes it so exciting and that's why it's so uh, fun for us to explore it and by the way like uh, just a small thing i was thinking about uh, in connection to the previous question uh, one more thing by the way in the way how we can separate between human objects even the secret ones and uh, the non-human objects that we are interested in the artificial let's call it et probes 
is that we are going to actually search quite far away from the Earth for starters. Because in that way, we get rid of all these satellites at low Earth orbit, and we, we get rid of the whole belt of human space debris. So it's a very good thing to try to start and the search is further out. Because there, everything that has been, or most of the stuff that humans have sent, are very like well known. So in other words, we, we know what the signatures of human technology are, and we should be able to tell that from alien technology. For example, if you were seeing, uh, say, the light from some kind of a photon drive or something like that, it would be so characteristically weird that it's it can't be something that humans produce, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's how I'm imagining that you can identify some of the unidentified objects, or if you find, let's say, something that maybe looks more like a conventional ET probe, but in completely wrong place. No country says that they have sent their uh, space rockets and it's too far out to just be a random object that is there that nobody knows what it is. That's also a possibility. Now you can use parallax to determine that distance, right? Of course. When you're using multiple telescopes and you can determine that this is either close or far away. Exactly. And that's what we want to do. So what is the, what, where are the telescopes going to be located? I mean, is it a globally or what telescope locations are we looking at? So actually, we hope to get it globally. Uh, but uh, in the first phase, it's going to be in California. So we are looking to put up a telescope there in Sierra Remote and also two more locations. So that's where we are now. We are trying to uh, uh, solve the administrative things uh, with the telescopes. What kind of uh, telescope apertures are we looking at? What uh, what are the size of these telescopes? It seemed to me you could do this very with very small instruments, right? Exactly. We are going to go for like uh, very professional, state of the art half meter telescopes that have super good tracking and very good mounts that are reliable to do this type of work. And yes, they are pretty expensive, so of course we have to uh, work on that end to make it happen. But this. Uh, yeah, we're imagining at least three telescopes in California and hopefully like um, within the near future. So one is being ordered and uh, there are two more not equally good as the one that we're ordering and one that also re one of them actually recently had an accident. So we need to solve that too. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a little accident that happened with one of them and we will probably we will need to replace it.